We welcome you to worship at Circle of Mercy. We're so glad that each of you have made your way here this evening. This is a special night of worship. We are gathering this evening for the installation of Stan Wilson and myself as co-pastors of Circle of Mercy. We are so very delighted that each of you are here with us this evening. I know we have a lot of guests among us, so if you'd be willing to stand up if you're with someone to introduce them or if you're willing to introduce yourself. Um, we'll, oh yes, go ahead, Sam. Well, I'm going to introduce uh, some friends from Mississippi Yay. and from Furman University. Uh, uh, surprising me tonight, Susan <laughs> Betters, uh, my longtime colleague at uh, Northside in Clinton. We worked together for 14 years there. Mm -hmm. And she's here with Beverly and Kenneth Huey, who now live in Brevard. Mm -hmm. Welcome. Thank you for being here. And then also, uh, some friends from Furman have uh, surprised me here tonight. Amy and Russ Dean are co-pastors at Park Road Baptist Church in Charlotte. And John Brooks is, uh, lives right here in Black Mountain with all <coughs> friends at Furman. Also want to welcome Karen and Dan Davis, who are right behind them, who have shown up, uh, surprising me. And I'm... Um, Missy and I both want to welcome Carol Collins for coming mm -hmm. from uh, the Alliance about this. Thank you, Carol, for all the work that you do holding us together across a lot of land and space and networks. Amen. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Well, we're always glad to have Sarah Wilcox with us. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes, Introduce Amy and April. <laughs> We're joined today by Amy Mears and April Baker, and I'm definitely biased um, because <laughs> they are the co pastors of the church who raised me, Glendale Baptist in Nashville, Tennessee. Uh, they've been co pastors since, this is my guess, 2003. Did I get it right? Four. I was close. Um, <laughs> Uh, and fulfill their roles with poise, humor, and so, so much love. I'm so thrilled they're here, and I hope you are too. Yeah. And we're so grateful that Kate Campbell is with us this evening. She's a singer, songwriter, and storyteller. We just brought half of Nashville here. Uh, <laughs> nice. We're so glad that you're here. Kate is one who pays close attention to the world around her, and all that she notices when she's paying attention comes through in her music and her stories. Kate's music takes many different forms from blues to jazz to folk to pop to country to music right from your hymn book. Her storytelling carries the notes of Southern writers like Flannery O'Connor and William Faulkner and Eudora Welty. Kate, we are so grateful that you're here with us again to share the gifts of your music with us and we're just glad to be in worship together this evening. Thank you all for being here. Each week when we begin our service, we light our candles, one for Wiley Dobbs, who lives in prison in Georgia. We light a candle for our friends in Cuba and all of the challenges that they are facing with shortages of so many needed supplies, and especially after this recent tropical storm passed through and for Kim and Stan that their journey will begin just a couple of weeks later. We light a candle for all whose lives have been impacted by COVID-19. We light a candle for all whose lives are impacted by violence in all of its forms. We light a candle for Harbor Faith Community in Ireland. And finally, we light a candle for those who are not able to be here with us this evening and for each of you. I'll invite you to stand. We gather with each other in a spirit of grace, mercy, and peace. As we gather, we remember all that have come before us to prepare the way. We do not arrive to this place alone. Friends, family members, parents, teachers, and pastors, and allies us, keeping alive and attending to the faith that resides within each of us. 
May the gifts of God that live within each of us be rekindled as we sing, speak, pray, and come to the table together. May the Spirit infuse us with the deep and abiding love of the May this deep and abiding love sustain us when we grow weary. May this deep and abiding love guide us when we lose our way. May this deep and abiding love enfold us when we feel alone. May this deep and abiding love stand among us when we need an advocate. May this deep and abiding love continue to open our hearts, minds, eyes, and ears to the heartbeat of the Holy One in all of creation. Amen.
of the stories is the people of Israel had gotten to Mount Sinai. They had been traveling for a long time, camping, waiting to see where God was leading them. And all of a sudden, I was Moses heard this voice, and he needed to go up to the top of the mountain to hear God. So he went up and got, got some important information from God, and came back down the mountain, and he was going to deliver it to the people who were there waiting for him. And there were some important things that he had to pass on to them, because he knew that he may not be with them always, that, that they might need to, to have some leaders among them who would be able to carry on the message and the work that, that he was doing with the people. And tonight, we're having a very special service here. Um, you heard us at the beginning, this is an installation service of me and Stan Wilson as co-pastors here at Circle of Mercy. And Stan's right over there on the front row. And I think there may be some people in our midst tonight who need some additional information about what they're supposed to do from this point forward. And there might be somebody who's wait, 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 wait. <laughs> yeah, we have some very, very important information to pass down. <laughs> Can I get the uh, preacher's kids on Kate and Abby to please come up here? So from one preacher kid of 46 years, you have ways to go. <laughs> to others, to you all, and I think we have a bunch of preacher's kids here in the Circle of Mercy right now. So on those same lines of important information that we need to pass down to our preacher's kids, any preacher's kids out there got any? Oh, good. <laughs>
Rest your heart in God. Let yourself float on the safe waters. Live your life as it comes. With all the rough weather it may bring.
It's an honor and a great pleasure to worship with you today. Mm -hmm. We at Glendale count the community of faith here at Circle of Mercy among our very closest kin. And just listening today, the connections that we have are deeper than I even knew. Mm -hmm. There are a lot of groups of worshiping Baptists and assorted scallywags that are as odd as we believe ourselves to be. Mm -hmm. It's always a breath of fresh air when we hear from you as individuals and as a congregation. The installation of co-pastors is a ritual that carries deep and special meaning for us. Missy Harris and Stan Wilson are pastors who have been friends and colleagues and fellow travelers of ours for decades. Thank you for the invitation to be here. For being with such divinely inspired worshipers and community. Our text today is from the beginning of Exodus in chapter 19. It's adapted from the Common English Bible translation. On exactly the third month anniversary of the Israelites leaving the land of Egypt, they came into the Sinai Desert. They traveled from Ephadim and they came into the Sinai Desert and they set up camp there. They camped there in front of the mountain while Moses went up to the mountain. Yahweh called to him from the mountain, this is what you should say to the people. You saw what I did to the Egyptians and how I lifted you up on eagle's wings and brought you to me. So now, if you faithfully obey me and stand true to my covenant, you will be my most precious possession out of all the peoples, since the whole earth belongs to me. You'll be a kingdom of priests for me and a holy nation. These are the words you should say to the Israelites. So Moses came down from the mountain and called together the people's elders and set them down and sat down before them. Sorry, there's a shadow on them. <laughs> Moses called the, Israel, the elders together, set down before them the words that Yahweh had commanded, and the people all responded with one voice. Everything that Yahweh has said, we will do. Mm -hmm. Moses reported to Yahweh what the people said. There's things to love in this passage, and there's things not to love. True of most of the Bible, maybe we could say. There's camping, and we love some fall days in a campground with apples and falling leaves and brisk nights around the campfire, right? Not really the main idea, or exactly what's going on here, but in general, camping's good, so we can give it that. But then there's the language difficulty, which we've made more palatable by using the Hebrew language Yahweh for the references to the divine and substituting the people for references to the traveling Hebrews that are usually called by the male name of the tribe with which they're associated. Then there's that mention of the disaster that has recently befallen all of the armies of Egypt swallowed up at sea at the hands of God and quite to the delight of the people which is a whole series of sermons for another day. Sam, Missy, y'all can take that. <laughs> what works well, though, for our consideration today is the partnership that's developing in the days and the months and the years when the people who feel especially connected with God are working out their relationship and learning how to work together. Everybody pretty much knows the basic story about how human beings tend to our relationships with all that is good and holy, all that is light and grace and mercy and love. Sometimes we do it well. Sometimes we stink it up. But communities like ours believe that learning to partner together in love with divine love is an effort worth giving our lives to. 
Using journey as a metaphor for life trying to follow Jesus is a tried and true practice. Glendale is partial to we are travelers on a journey, fellow pilgrims on the way. It's a lifelong journey for sure. A good many years ago, the theme for Peace Camp was walk together, children, don't you get weird. The persistent work of moving ahead, of stepping out, of keeping on, especially if there are others who depend on you to choose the best, the safest, the most adventuresome, the easiest, the challenge, most challenging, the gentlest, rugged path forward, that can exhaust the body, mind, spirit, and soul. Walking together can be the antidote. We discovered this truth at a personal level in our own attempts on the journey. Amy and I both grew up in South Carolina towns, but with a great appreciation for wide open spaces and pine trees and creeks and rivers and lakes. And it's been good for our pastoral partnership that we're both hikers. It's been good to be in Middle Tennessee where there's been hiking to be had. And so as it is, as often as we can, some point during the week finds us with a dog-eared copy of 60 hikes within 60 miles of Nashville, water bottles in hand, boots in the car, as we attempt to relocate ourselves as church leaders. And it was on one of those walks early in our 18 years of working together that our, our next article, early on, our next article, we hadn't had a person yet. <laughs> But that was conceived. The conversation began something like this. Is good hiking like good pastoral partnering? Or is it that hiking in general is good for pastoral partnering? partnering? And the answer we discovered is yes, both. Hiking and collaborating inform each other. The voice of the sacred in the text reminds us that, it's, that remaining true to the path connected to the covenant that's good for our relationship with God, our relationship with one another. In places along the way, we continue to discover such things. So, a few brief lessons about collaboration, about having and being a partner that we've learned along the way. To begin with, having another opinion and getting started is valuable. Choosing a path, metaphorically or literally, produces insight and information that's critical. Asking, where shall we go today, allows us to assess our condition, what we're fit for, how much time we've got, who's realistic today, and who's living beyond the bounds of the space-time continuum. <laughs> the one who's tether-free of thought in a, let's just drive till we see where we want to walk, offsets the one who's totally earthbound by the heaviness of life's constraints right now. You see where this is going, right? Because on any given day in the front study or in the back study at Glendale Baptist Church, we're having the same conversation. Do you want to do pastoral care calls? Which one of us has energy for that today? Shall we do some worship planning together or do you need to do a mindless task like writing vouchers for a while? I'll go to the hospital and you can do some sermon work. Hiking, pastoring, choosing a path, planning out loud before a hike means that we're less likely to miss stuff that we'll be needing to know to do. It's strikingly like pastoring together. One of the things that's been a delightful find for us is recognizing our intuitive ability to switch off the lead. The ebb and flow of leading well, following well, and falling in easily when the trail widens and we can walk side by side, mirrors the ease with which we do our partnership. It requires a pretty healthy ego to come and to go and to give and to take, and it requires trust that the one in front will lead well, and the one bringing up the rear can do that task well. It requires a certain level of similarity, we had to work a lot harder at this if one of us was six foot eight and one of us was four foot eight and we were trying to keep pace with one another on the trail. Or if one of us came in as a marathoner while the other one just 
just disliked all forms of exercise. <laughs> or if one was always too hot and one was always too cold. While there are different levels of preparation and ability for different tasks and different circumstances, a general level of similarity is helpful. In the church, this is obvious as we toss tasks back and forth to one another with relative ease and confidence. You take a lead on this meeting and I'll go to school on your ability to deal with group process. And when somebody needs to ask a fiercely difficult question, I'll be there to toss it to you. That being said, it's also true that we find great value in the fact that the two of us see different things on the trail. We draw attention to different ways of being aware, and we bring different knowledge and appreciation to the experience. There's someone here who knows stuff I don't know, and I'm able then to see more, because someone else is there who sees things differently, and who sees things that I don't see. When we started out hiking together, I would have missed 90% of the wildflowers if Amy had been there to point it out to me. And if you want to know about wildflowers, you should ask her. <laughs> but I'd see a whole lot of the interesting knots in trees and the bark and the clouds and other things and call them to her attention. Being together alleviates boredom, particularly if the walk's a little bit dull or if it's just kind of the mundane day to day. It allows companionship, loud or quiet, depending on what the day requires. Perhaps the most important survival strength that hiking together and pastoring together provides is the reminder to shift the load. Literally and figuratively, we are more aware together that one person doesn't have to carry it all. In fact, should not carry it all except for in short bursts. Novelist Leif Inger in his book So Brave, Young, and Handsome says that tired people assess their chances unwisely. Having a strong partner helps to alleviate the tiredness and it increases the wisdom. The bad news is that burnout and isolation kills pastors. We know that. The good news? Collaborative pastoral ministry is the anti-venom. And speaking of anti-venom, hiking's taught us to play to our individual strengths, and that that's a good and important gift of partnership. One of us, it turns out, is the right pair of snake person. The other was perhaps a little reptile challenge. <laughs> On the other hand, the issuer of snake life is a fair hand of bears. The other is a little less comfortable in that arena. Tell me we don't have to unpack that desperately. <laughs> other quick lessons. There's someone to point things out to, to share the beauty with, to tell stories with and about. And somebody there to hear your story when it's ready to be told. There's opportunity on the journey to plan for the future. Time to talk through issues while mildly distracted by walking or wildflowers or snakes or bears. There's someone there to remind me to do the right thing. Like stopping for a drink of water or to check the map or to take a rest when I'm too distracted or hurried to do it on my own. There's someone to consult with when there's a question. Is this dangerous, do you think? It's a good one for me. And there's security that if something does go wrong, and something's going to go wrong, that there are two of us, and we can probably live through it because we have two sets of experiences and two sets of expertise instead of just one. Furthermore, there's tremendous trust in each other's abilities in the woods and in the church. If we're lost, I'd be fretful, but not afraid, because between us, we'd have sufficient resource to survive a big challenge. And neither of us has the sole responsibility for making it succeed. We believe that we experience the presence of the Holy. We live into the covenant as we do work together in creating a model of collaborative leadership in our little corner of the world. 
One of our first conversations about pastoral partnership occurred years ago when they had Simon, who has been giving us life-giving ways of doing this work in the community of faith since before we were born. When Mahan led us to think in some wonderful new ways. Mahan says, if we are partners with the Spirit in our day, overturning power over relationships, dominating patterns, coercive ways of leading, in exchange for power with relationships, equality, just ways of leading and relating, then shared pastoral models are a cutting-edge manifestation of that spirit. Shared pastoral ministry incarnates the relational nature of God as we are relational creatures. Models of shared pastoral ministry are a prophetic witness to the larger church. The shared pastoral ministry is but a mirror for the life of a faith community, reflecting its hopes and its values that say, this is good not just for the pastoral leaders, but for all of us. Each of these pastors partners with you as a congregation. Each of these pastors partners with you as individuals. And a pair of them are your partners, collectively and with you alone. As our life together is shaped differently and our ways of leading and following and collaborating grow into deeper mutuality, we gain understanding of what it means to be the precious people of the sacred. Belden Lane is a Presbyterian theologian who teaches on a Jesuit faculty at St. Louis University. His interests include the relationships between geography and faith wilderness backpacking in the Ozarks, the magic of storytelling, desert spirituality, exposing students to urban poverty through the Catholic workers' community, and the poetry of Rumi. Belden once was introduced as a Presbyterian minister teaching at a Roman Catholic university telling Jewish stories at the Vedanta Society. Mm -hmm. His book, The Solace of Fierce Landscapes, Exploring Desert and Mountain Spirituality, has been especially useful for me. His other book that I really love is called Backpacking with the Saints. It's about hiking with Thomas Traherne. Thomas Traherne was born in 1637 and was a poet, an Anglican clergy person, a theologian, a religious writer along the lines of John Donne and George Herbert and those other metaph metaphysical poets of the day. One of the ideas that Belden most likes about Traherne is his emphasis on felicity. For Traherne, felicity is our deepest humanity, the breaking open of the soul to beauty, our being stunned by a yawning capacity for boundless enjoyment. Felicity, says Belden Lane, is a down payment on the satisfaction of infinite desire. It is Earth's mirroring of God's own inexhaustible delight. Maybe it's not exactly a replication of the sacred covenant made between the divine and the people who are to be God's most precious possession in all the world. But maybe it is a life-giving trail hike in the right direction. Beloved friends in the circle of mercy, Stan, Missy, know that your fellow travelers in Nashville are holding you in our esteem and in our affections and in our care as you begin this journey with one another. A journey that moves toward the fullest expression of your hearts and your minds and your imaginations. We'll be hiking with you. Just over on our side of the mountains. We'll be seeking wisdom and playfulness and compassion and courage along with you. And then the journey bring us toward Earth's mirroring of God's own inexhaustible delight. May this be so for us today and forevermore.
Today we stand with each other, recognizing Christ in our midst, affirming our faith in the one who loves us with a love that transforms us, and who calls us to work for a transformed world. Today we stand with each other, recognizing Christ in each other, affirming the calling of the Spirit who has brought us together on this day. Today we bring ourselves and the gifts we have, and we covenant to serve and encourage the church and community, to respect and care for you, to journey with you, to take responsibility among you, to seek God with you, to listen to God in you, and to work with you as the body of Christ in the world. Say with me in unison. Today we bring ourselves and the gifts we have, and we covenant to serve and encourage this church and community, to respect and care for each other, to take responsibility for the people we are, and the people we hope to be in God's love, and to encourage you as ministers as we make this journey together. What kind of people does Christ call us to be? We are called to be a prophetic people, working for justice, resisting violence, and challenging the abuse of power. We are called to be a hospitable people, welcoming the stranger, and pulling down walls that divide us from one another. We are called to be a hopeful people, risking uncertainty, becoming vulnerable, reflecting the generosity of God. We are called to be a worshiping people, seeking and celebrating the one who journeys with us, offering everything we have and all we are to the mercy who enfolds us. We are sent into the world as Christ was sent, to become fully human, and to take our role in God's sacred story, unfolding even now. We've made it back to the communioning table. It's been another war torn week, a volatile, stormy week, a week of both sorrow and joy. And we were sent into it with nothing but our fragile human selves to witness and serve and embody the grace and wonder of God's love. And now we've made it back to this table, which belongs to the one who calls us together and who sends us out. We are here to do the slow work of repentance and truth-telling. We're here to do the patient work of a, of a community who waits for one another as we share a simple meal. We're here to rekindle the fiery gift of God stoked by the Spirit. We're here to remember and become the body, the body of Christ broken with us in all the world. It is a great gift to be your pastors, to watch and listen as you process into this circle from your many sacred places in the world. As you embrace one another. And encourage one another. And pray for one another. Ache and rejoice for one another. And then lean forward as one to hear the good news that turns the world upside down. It is a gift to shepherd this story, passed down to us, that on the night when Jesus was betrayed, he took the bread and broke it. And after he had given thanks, he said, this is my body given for you. I'm with you. Do this and remember me. And in the same way, he took the cup also after supper saying, this cup is the new covenant. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. So you are all invited to this communing table together. We will serve communion. Uh, one person will break the, Stan will break the bread and dip it into the cup for each of you and place it in your hands so that there's only one person uh, touching the bread. And I will be on the side to offer a blessing with oil. If you would like to receive that, we can do that on the back of your hand. So we invite you all to come and join us at this table where there's more than enough.
Peace be. 
Thank you, Amy and April. And you're all invited to join us for a meal over at Hawk Creek Commons. Um, there are some little pieces of paper here on the table, on the um, altar, with directions for how to get over there. If you'll give us a good 10 or 15 minutes, we'll have things set up and ready to go over there for, for supper once we conclude our service. God be your comfort, your strength. God be your hope and support. God be your light and your way. And the blessing of God, creator, redeemer, and giver of life, remain with you now and always. Amen. Amen. And Kate's going to close us out with Shining Like the Sun. I think everybody needs to stand up for this. Burton, if you haven't uh, indulged yourself at some point to uh, read uh, Thomas Burton. But, uh, you know, it's kind of a. Uh, feel like joining in, you know, you'll, you'll, I think you'll like, we'll repeat that little shining like the sun thing a couple of times throughout, so you're all ready for it there. Let's see if I, uh, am I on the right key with y'all?